obvious and not so obvious reasons to love air barriers. Air barriers are awesome. Everybody knows this, but even though everybody knows this, I still think that air barriers and more broadly air control are underappreciated. The most obvious thing to love about air barriers is of course their contribution to energy efficiency. This is pretty intuitive to most of us. The better we are at separating the inside from the outside, the less energy we require to condition the interior space. But I don't think that people, even professionals, really appreciate how important this is compared to other energy-related design decisions. Behind glazing ratio, air tightness is the second most important enclosure-related factor influencing how much energy a building will use. It's more important even than insulation, and that is astounding. Something else I think a lot of us don't appreciate is how much more energy efficient our residential buildings have gotten over the past 30 years or so. The government has a census of sorts, but for buildings, it's called the Residential Energy Consumption Survey, or RECS, and the data on residential buildings is fascinating. Our homes and apartments have gotten more energy efficient by every metric. Energy use per square foot is down from 55 kBTUs in 1993 to 38 kBTUs in 2015, which is the most recent year that, uh, that we have data. The 2018 survey results, by the way, will be published later in 2022. But this, of course, is just energy use per square foot. Homes are also larger than they used to be, and we have fewer occupants per household. Even so, energy use per household is also down from 104 million BTUs in 1993 to 77 million BTUs in 2015. And energy use per household member is similarly reduced. The average person used 40 million BTUs at home in 1993 and only 30 million BTUs by 2015. This is exactly the trend line we wanna see. Improved air control is one of the main reasons we're seeing these real improvements in energy consumption. And in my opinion, it's still the lowest hanging fruit in terms of continued energy savings. We still have a lot of runway left here, and that's a great thing. But it's not just energy. Airtight buildings are substantially more comfortable for occupants, like noticeably so. Airtight buildings are better at dust and allergen control, pest control, odor control, acoustic performance, and thermal comfort. When I say the difference is noticeable, it really is noticeable. People who move from a typical building to one that is more airtight tend to notice things like their house not being drafty anymore, their allergies aren't as bad, they see fewer insects, their house is quieter. I grew up with a, uh, with a train right behind our house and I never noticed that train. People get used to things that they think they can't change. How comfortable our houses are can be changed. And the easiest way to make them noticeably more comfortable is by making them more airtight. So how do we measure airtightness? We use something called a blower door. Blower doors use a large fan to pressurize a building to a set pressure, usually 50 pascals, and we then infer how many times all the air in the house would be replaced if we were to hold that pressure constant for an hour. This is referred to as the air change per hour, or ACH at 50 pascals, or whatever the pressure we chose was. 50 pascals, by the way, is about the pressure created by a 20 mile per hour wind. The thing to keep in mind about blower door tests is that buildings don't actually operate at 50 pascals. The way we run the test involves pressurizing the whole house to a set pressure. The reason we do this is so that we can compare different buildings. But pressurizing a building in this way has the effect of treating all holes in the enclosure equally, even though they're not equal. Two holes of the same size in different parts of your house can contribute very differently to the actual in-service performance of your house. A small hole in your ducts, for example, will likely contribute to the actual in-service performance of your house much more than a larger hole somewhere else in the enclosure would. But it gets even more complicated than that. Remember that the blower door test is not telling you what the air change rate for your house will be. It's telling you what the air change rate is at a particular pressure. 
in cold climates, the temperature difference between the inside and the outside is greater than the temperature difference between the inside and the outside in a warm climate. And this means that even identical houses with identical discontinuities in the enclosure with identical blower door test numbers will leak air differently depending on the climate they're in. The greater temperature difference in cold climates will induce more air through the holes in an enclosure than would pass through the same holes in the same enclosure if we were to move it to a climate where the temperature difference were less. Now, you don't need to know all that to design good buildings. The reason I explained that part is because it's really important to think of our buildings holistically. There's a tendency to latch on to one metric or another to the exclusion of other really important things. And lower door tests can be like that. We have a tendency to substitute tests and metrics for the thing the test or metric is supposed to measure. What matters to us is comfort, efficiency, and durability in service, not the blower door test results. Now that said, the beauty of the blower door test is that it allows us to compare similar buildings. It gives us a baseline. It's also a really convenient metric to use during construction as a quality control tool. Let's take a look at some air tightness metrics to give us some perspective. A passive house, which is a particularly rigorous design standard, requires houses to test at 0.6 air changes at 50 pascals. The building code in cold climates, zones three through eight, can require houses to test lower than three air changes at 50 pascals, while codes in warmer climates can require houses to be no more than five air changes at 50 pascals. With standard materials, pretty good detailing, and generally attentive construction, hitting three air changes at 50 pascals is absolutely achievable. And it's quite good, that's a, that's a comfortable house. It's substantially better than the house you probably grew up in. It's substantially better than the old craftsman I live in now, but it's also an area where with some adjustments to your detailing, you really can be more ambitious and be rewarded for it. Why the difference between cold and warm climates? Why do codes tend to be more relaxed down south? One reason I already alluded to, in cold climates, we see more natural air change through the same holes because of the larger temperature difference. So the consequences of leaky buildings is in some ways greater in cold climates. Note that this temperature element affects the in-service performance of a building though. It doesn't show up in a blower door test. And the other reason the codes tend to be less strict about air tightness in warmer climates is because it's so common to put the mechanical equipment in our attics in the south. From a purely practical perspective, this makes it much harder to meet our air tightness targets. The ducts themselves leak and the mechanical penetrations where the ducts penetrate the ceiling also leak. So three air changes in the south with the mechanical equipment in a vented attic is indeed more difficult to achieve and the codes tend to reflect that. Quick aside here, it's really not a good idea to put the mechanical equipment in an unconditioned vented attic in the south or anywhere else. Most people assume this is because it's energy inefficient, and that's true, it is energy inefficient to put our air conditioner in the absolute hottest part of the house outside our thermal enclosure. But there are two worse reasons. One is that it's likely our ducts will leak. Again, people jump to the energy implications of that and think of how inefficient it is to be cooling the outside. They liken it to leaving your doors and windows wide open. But it's not just that we're cooling the outside. When ducts leak into a vented attic, they depressurize the house, which causes exterior air to bypass the air barrier through defects and discontinuities to make up for the losses in the attic. So essentially, not only are we cooling the outside with leaky ducts, but the leaky ducts are causing more of the outside to come inside. Again, this is inefficient, but also uncomfortable when the air we bring in is too hot or humid. It's typically bad for indoor air quality and it can cause moisture problems. The reason I'm going to the trouble of explaining this during a discussion of air barriers is because when we put ducts in the attic, the ducts themselves are part of the enclosure. They're part of the air barrier system. 
and leaky ducts can obliterate the performance improvements gained from an otherwise well-detailed, attentively installed air barrier at the wall, ceiling, and foundation. So don't overlook the ducts. And really, don't put the mechanical equipment in a vented attic in the first place. This is an architectural design decision relating to performance. It's not just a mechanical design decision. But I mentioned there were two worse reasons to put mechanical equipment in vented attics. Leaky ducts obliterating other air tightness benefits is just one of them. And if you do a really, really good job of sealing the ducts, that issue can be uh, certainly mitigated, maybe overcome. The other issue is that we'll get condensation on the ducts and cause moisture problems in the attic. We used to get away with this because attics were so hot and we would oversize our mechanical system, which meant it just wouldn't run for very long. So we'd get short periods of condensation paired with plenty of drying into the hot attic when the AC wasn't running. Now we increasingly use reflective roofs and radiant barriers, which reduce attic temperatures, which in turn reduce drying. We've also gotten better at right-sizing our mechanical equipment, which extends the runtime or duty cycle of our air conditioner. This means cold air is flowing through the ducts for longer each hour. Now, taken together, these changes have led to increased wetting and decreased drying and a lot of really wet attics. So let's keep the mechanical equipment inside the enclosure. It is not just a matter of efficiency, it's also a matter of risk. We've talked about why we wanna make buildings more airtight and we've talked about how we measure airtightness. Now let's talk briefly about how we can actually make them more airtight. Basically, we wanna pick an air control membrane, an air barrier, and detail it to be continuous around the entire enclosure. Usually, it makes sense to locate the air barrier on the exterior of the sheathing. And in our walls, it's usually most convenient for the air barrier to be the same material we use to control water. So our water control membrane gets a new name. We can call it the water and air control membrane. There are three categories of water and air control membrane, mechanically attached membranes, fluid and self-adhered membranes, and integral sheathing plus water and air control membranes. The second two categories are fully bonded to the sheathing, and these tend to be much better at air control than the mechanically attached membranes. When we use mechanically attached membranes, even though they're marketed as air barriers, the de facto air tightness often comes from the sheathing or the interior drywall. When we talk about detailing for air tightness, for whatever reason, our mind jumps first to things that are in the scheme of things usually not that important. We can be shockingly bad at detailing large holes and really pretty good at closing off the small ones. But not surprisingly, it's the large holes that matter more. So what are the big holes? The biggest sources of air infiltration and exfiltration are attached garages, loading docks, wall to foundation connections, wall to roof connections, ceilings, soffits, canopies, overhangs, porch roofs, balconies, and ducts. These are the conditions that merit the most attention during detailing and installation. In summary, air barriers are terrific. They're terrific for energy efficiency, indoor air quality, and for comfort. To get the best performance, choose an excellent membrane, probably one that's fully bonded to the sheathing, pay attention to the big holes, and make sure the mechanical equipment is located inside the enclosure.